means it's a, it's a pleasure. So I will be talking about, um, yeah, trees, uh, all sorts of trees. And uh, okay, this uh, intriguing title may be Trees on Trees. It is, it is indeed mostly about data structures, but not only. This is a, a joint work. Uh, actually, it covers the work in two papers uh, that I co-authored with a bunch of people, including Jit Bose from Carleton University, Ottawa, Canada, uh, John, Greg, and Stefan from Brussels. And uh, part of it was actually done while Stefan and I were visiting Pablo Perez Lontero in the uh, University of Santiago de Chile. So, yes. So um, let me start slowly. Um, I guess most of you have heard of binary trees, but maybe depending on whether you're a combinatorist or a computer scientist, you may see binary trees as different objects. If you're into combinatorics, maybe uh, you see binary trees as, you know, a Catalan family, a family of objects uh, that are in bijection with things like uh, order trees or parenthesis expression or triangulations of a convex polygon or dike paths. You may have heard of the associahedron. If you're a computer scientist, maybe you'd rather see them as a data structure, right? A, a way to search a set of n totally ordered elements uh, by bisecting among them, right? So a binary search tree is really the picture of a, a bisection search, right? You look for an element, you look at the root. If it's not your element, you go left or right, depending on whether the element you actually look for is larger or smaller than the element at the root, okay? So far, so good. So these boundary trees, uh, there's, they have this operation on, on, on them, which is a, a standard transformation that's called a, a, a rotation, okay? A rotation in the binary tree consists of considering a pair of parent-child node and invert this relation, make the child the parent. If the child, for instance, V here is a right child, then it, its parent becomes its left parent, okay? And you reattach the subtrees accordingly, uh, say, respecting in the binary search tree view, the total order, right? A, P, B, V, C, A, P, B, V, C. Okay, so you just flip uh, those two nodes and you reattach the, the, the subtrees uh, uh, properly. This is called a rotation. And this rotation operation, it induces a binary, it's symmetric, right? It goes both ways. So it induces a, a binary relation on top of the say binary trees with n internal nodes. Okay, let's call n the number of internal nodes. For instance, here n equals four. And this graph is called the rotation graph among binary trees. And it's in one-to-one -one correspondence also with the so-called flip graph on triangulation of a convex polygon, where a flip is you, you exchange two diagonals of a quadrilateral that's made of four edges of the, of the triangulation. And this flip graph is, is well studied, it's well understood. If, uh, if you like order theory, this, this uh, flip graph can be seen as the cover graph of a partial order, which happens to be a lattice called the Tamari lattice. The order actually matches the weak ordering on permutation. It's, it's actually a lattice congruence of the weak order on permutation. So this is a well studied object in partial order theory. It's also, this graph is also the skeleton of a polyhedron, that's called the associahedron. Okay, so here's a picture of the associahedron for uh, n equals four. For any n, the associahedron is the n minus one dimensional object. So for n equals four, it's a three dimensional thing. And here's the picture for n equals four. It's, it's, it's a structure, a geometric object that's been popping up in many different fields of mathematics, not only uh, combinatorics, but also uh, topology, even in physics. Don't, don't ask me too much about this part. It's been re rediscovered several times. It, it first appears in a work by Tamari in the 50s. It was popularized by Stashev. They're also called Stashev polytopes. I think Stashev asked whether these were actual geometric polytopes. And uh, now we know of many distinct geometric realizations of this, of this polytope. There's, but we will mainly be interested in the skeleton of this polytope, so the rotation graph. And one question that's been asked about this skeleton, oops, yes, is what is its uh, diameter? So the diameter of the associahedron is the maximum number of rotations that are required to transform 
one binary tree on any internal node into some other binary tree, okay? It's the maximum distance along the edges in terms of number of edges along the edges of the associated heap. And this question has been asked by Slato and Tajan, who are two famous data structures people. And it's been answer answered in, uh, uh, in the 80s, in 1988, by Slato, Tajan, and Thurston. And uh, it's, it's an interesting paper. They use hyperbolic geometry and volume arguments to prove that the diameter of the associated hedron is uh, for n sufficiently large to uh, n minus six for the n that we've chosen here, which is in, in binary tree uh, version, the number of internal nodes. And this proof was um, made purely combinatorial and sort of refined quite recently by Lionel Pournin in a, in a, in a famous paper. And it's true for any n at least nine or, or some, some small value like this. Before that, it was only known for n sufficiently large and actually very large. So the maximum number of rotations that you need to transform any binary tree into any other is at most essentially two times n. There's another, from the data structure's point of view, you can ask you know, the question of what is the best adaptive strategy for searching a given set of elements, of n elements, in a given order. So people introduced the so-called binary search tree search model, a binary search tree computation model, which allows you to do some operations at unique cost on your binary search tree. And those are finger moves. You can go to your parents, to your left child or to your right child. So you move one finger, you have one finger that you move uh, around uh, your, your binary tree, and then you can do a rotation with your parent. And those four operations are all unit cost operations. Anything else you can do for free, but those are the only ones that are taken into account in, in, in the model. And you're given a so-called access sequence of nodes, a sequence of elements among the, uh, the set of n elements with repetitions and any sequence, possibly very long sequence, and we asked, what is the minimum sequence of unique cost operations that touch these nodes in order, in, that, in, in the given order, okay? And um, so this is what you want to do in a, in a dynamic binary search tree, right? You access the elements and then you move, you move along your tree and then you do some rotation. You sort of adapt yourself to the queries, right? To the successive queries. And um, if you know the queries in advance, then you can prepare, you know, you can do the right set of rotations, you can, you know, look ahead and, and, and prepare for future queries. But what if you're online, you don't know the future queries, right? And you move along your tree, you do the rotation, and you sort of do your best to prepare for future queries that you don't know. Well, this is an online problem. And there's, this, this, there, there's been this long standing open problem of whether there was a constant competitive online binary search tree algorithm, okay? Constant competitive meaning some algorithm that would do up within a constant factor of the smallest possible number of operations, even if you know the access sequence in advance, right? So competitive means you compare yourself to the best offline algorithm, an algorithm that knows the queries, the, the, the future queries, right? Can you do as good as this algorithm, even if you don't know, up to a constant factor? This is the question, okay? So this is, Okay, there's been many, many papers. It's been a, a long-standing uh, open problem. And there's a famous conjecture by Slato and Tajan that goes back to the mid-80s that play trees are constant competitive. Okay, so I won't detail play trees here. It's a, a very simple, clever, adaptive strategy for searching and rotating in a binary, binary search tree. And uh, there's no counterexample to their big of one competitiveness. Okay, it, Splay trees are conjectured to be called, could be so-called dynamically optimal in the sense that they're constant competitive online binary search trees. The best we know as an upper bound is uh, the structure known as tango trees, which are bigger of log log n competitive. Okay, and this, this, is a, this was a breakthrough result. The title of the paper is Dynamic Optimality Almost by Eric Demain, Diane Hamon, John Yakono, and Mihai Patrescu in 2007, okay? So we know of algorithms that perform, you know, finger moves and rotations adaptively uh, so that 
the number of operations you, you make is within the log log n factor of the best possible, even if you know the queries in advance, even with an offline adversary. So this is sort of the state of the art for, uh, okay, not complete, but uh, uh, about uh, online binary search trees, the adaptive data structures point of view on, on, on binary trees. So let's move on now with the topic of this talk. So what do I mean by trees on trees? Well, binary search trees, they deal with n linearly ordered elements, right? And you know, once you're at some root node, you know whether you need to go left or right by comparing the elements because the universe is totally sorted. We want to generalize this notion of search tree to a tree, tree structured space, okay? Now the elements, they don't live on a line, you know, from smaller to bigger, they live on a tree, okay? And you want to do a search tree, you want to construct a search tree on top of this tree, okay? So there are two trees involved. There's the search space that we'll call G and the search tree that we'll call T, okay? Just as there's the search space, which is essentially a path, right, or a line, in binary search trees, and then you, top, you build a tree on top of it. Now we want to tree, build a tree on top of a tree structured space. And it appears, and the first time I saw this, I was quite surprised that actually the definitions of rotations and the associated combinatorics, the associahedra, and many, many things would actually generalize to this setting. And actually, it also works for trees on graphs. I, I would concentrate on trees on trees. But actually, many of those notions actually carry through when G, the underlying search space, is actually any graph. And then we can ask two questions on those, uh, on those structures, on those trees and trees. We can ask about the diameter. What's the maximum number of rotations to go from one search tree to any other? And then can we define and can we you know, design competitive online search trees on trees? These are the two questions that I will address in this talk. Um, any questions so far about what I said so far? No? No question? So let me move on. Okay, so first, what, what do I mean really? So on the left, we have a tree G. Okay, it's a tree in the graph theoretic sense. It's just an acyclic, simple graph, okay, with label vertices. And here's a search tree. T on G. So how does it work? Look at the root C, you take C, then suppose you take C out, you remove C from the tree G, this splits G into three connected components. Agree? So you have one singleton A and then B and then the rest of the nodes there. Right? This means you, have, you will have three subtrees. Two of them will be composed of only one node, <clears throat> A and B, and then one subtree will contain all the other the other nodes. And when you just you just move on, you pick a root in the remaining among the, the in, in the remaining connected component of, of G minus the root, okay? And um, say this root is F, okay? So you pick the vertex F here. And suppose you remove it again, this splits this connected components again into three parts, right? E, H, and then all the other vertices there. Okay? And then you iterate this. You consider this part, you pick a root i, and this splits the tree into two connected components, one containing dg and the other one containing jkl, and so on, right? So very simple definition, just take any root, and then this splits in, you know, the remaining tree into connected components, and then you just recurse on those. So there's no clear order now on the connected components, right? Just that the nodes are in you know, maybe the node you look for, if you do a search, that it lies in one of the connected components, and this is where, where you want to go. Binary search trees are special cases of trees on trees where the underlying tree G is a path, right? And then you can order, you know, the vertices of the path from left to right, and then you pick a root, and then you got the left part and the right part, okay? So trees on trees generalize binary search trees in that sense, right? They're trees built on top of trees, while binary search trees would be trees built on top of paths. Okay, and now the search, think of the search space. Euler tour trees. 
So I have a question. How does this notion compare with Euler 2 trees? I'm not sure what, I'm afraid I don't know what Euler 2 trees are. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to clarify. So yes. what is a Euler 2 tree? You take a tree and mm -hmm. then you take an Euler 2 on them. So basically this just linearizes the tree. Yes. And then you build a binary, balanced binary tree on top of that Euler tour. So uh, it seems to me that at some level, these two notions are in similar in spirit, in the sense that you just want to represent a tree in using some hierarchical data structure, which is also a tree. Yes, yes, okay. So you mean by Euro tree, you mean you use every edge twice? Yeah, right. Yes, and then, but then nodes appear at multiple, I mean, you, you visit some nodes many times. Yes. But then you build a, a, a binary tree on top of the nodes? Of, yeah, on top of the nodes. Uh, it, it, this is different, right? But uh, maybe I, sh I, should, I should look at this. Maybe there's, there's something to be said about the thing, but this is not what we're doing. Yeah, right. right. Okay. So yeah. Notice picked once. It actually has many. It occurs in many places in in combinatorics and algorithms. This this these trees, but um, I'm not sure. I, I I would say it's not related, but I, I maybe I should look up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And um, in the search tree, the descendants of a node are unordered. Yes. I mean, if if you if you have a a path, then you know that there's a left and a right. Right? Why here you just know there's disconnected component, disconnected component, disconnected component. So, so there's no natural way of drawing the tree such that the children are ordered in some way. Right? Maybe you can um, orient the, the, the tree G, like draw it in some way, and then draw the search tree according to the orientation that you're given in, in the drawing of G. But it's, this ordering wouldn't be relevant. Right? It, it, it's natural in the case of the path because there's, there's a left side and a right side. Any other question? Okay, so is, is, is this clear? Because this is, this is what I'm going to talk about all along. So make, make sure that we all understand this. Yes? And um, okay, I, I, I said many things uh, carry through translate from binary search trees to trees on trees and rotations do. And um, you, you, you can define them the exact same way. So, Suppose you have this P that is a parent of V in, in the search tree on top of this tree on there, on, 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 on the top of the, of the slide. Now suppose that instead of, if when you are at this, the connected component containing P and V, suppose that you select V as the root instead of P, right? And then whenever you can, in the connected component containing P, you pick P as the root, right? So you just flip them, you just flip the order in which you choose the root in, in this, in the subtree containing this, I mean, top, built on top of this tree there, right? And then the subtrees, they reattach naturally. So the connected component that is in between P and V remains attached to P, right? And there can only be one of them, right? Because it's a tree. And all the others, they remain attached to their original, uh, I mean, to, to, their, to the same parents, right? So D and E and A and B, they remain attached to V and P respectively, okay? So this drawing is completely general, right? This is how you do rotations in search trees on trees, and it's, it's consistent. So um, in this case, you can rotate uh, with respect to any pair of vertices at all? Yes. Okay. Yes, so if you look at your search tree, you can always, you pick a, 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 a tree, a, a node, sorry, an experiment, you can always perform a rotation on, on them. Right, it's always between a node and its parent. Thank you. Okay, so a node V and its parent. And of course, it's like you can go the other direction, right? So you can, you can move from the right to the left. So it's, it's also a symmetric uh, operation. Is that clear? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is not new. This definition is far from being new. Actually, it's been, it appears in many different contexts with many different names, okay? It's known as vertex ranking, okay? Um, in this, def I mean, it, okay, it's not the exact same definition in the sense that you, in, if you define vertex ranking, you don't make the tree explicit, but it's, there's a complete one-to-one -one correspondence between the, the definition of a vertex ranking and a search tree on tree. It's really essentially the same thing. 
And um, it's been shown, for instance, in 1989 by Schaeffer that you could compute a minimum height search tree on a tree in linear time. Okay. So this, and I mean, the title of the paper is Vertex Ranking of Trees in Linear Time. And uh, vertex ranking have been defined also for more general families of, of graphs and the complexity. What, what people were interested in uh, with respect to vertex ranking is the complexity of, I mean, in our terminology, the complexity of uh, identifying a, a minimum height search tree on top of a graph or, or, or a tree, okay? And this minimum height is called the tree depth of the tree or the graph. And tree depth is a graph parameter that's been also widely studied by people interested in structural graph theory. There's a whole chapter on tree depth in the famous book by Neje Trill and Osona de Mendez on sparsity in graphs, right? This is a, the, the Bible on, on, on graph sparsity. There's a whole chapter on tree depth of graphs and, and the, uh, the connection and the different bias equivalent definition and the connection to other graph invariants which has uh, different kind of widths like the tree width and, and, and things like that and, and other sort of sparsity parameters. So people in structural graph theory, they can relate to this notion via the, the, the definition of, uh, of the tree depth of a graph. People in combinatorics have been looking at graph associahedra. So again, those trees can be defined on top of graphs the exact same way and they have rotations. And actually the rotation graph is the, also the skeleton of a polytope called the graph associahedron. And this being defined simultaneously I think roughly simultaneously by Karen Devados, Satyan Devados on one hand, and um, Posnikov on the other hand, who identif Posnikov identifies graph associahedra as a special case of so-called uh, generalized permutohedra, which is even uh, even wider generalization of associahedra. So lots of uh, polyhedral combinatorics going on there. And then there are people also interested in algorithm, algorithms and the problem of searching in a tree or searching in a graph or searching in a, in a tree structured partial order and, and things like that. And that's like, I mean, many very much related or slightly related search models in trees and graphs have been defined. So I give a few names there. Uh, there's a recent paper, for instance, I think it's a, I think it's a stock paper on searching in graphs, which defines a model that is sort of closely related to what we do here on top of trees. So lots of connections to other fields in, in both uh, combinatorics, graph theory, and, uh, and algorithms. So the first question I mentioned was uh, diameter of associahedra, uh, diameter of tree associahedra. So remember that um, there was this question of the diameter of the regular classical associahedron that is was shown to be essentially two times n, okay, linear, and Okay, we have this precise sharp bound of 2n minus 6 for Vienna I, I use. And the same question was asked about um, tree associahedra. So what is the maximum number of rotations that you have to perform on a search tree on a tree to transform it into another search tree on the same tree? Okay, what's the maximum worst case bound on that? Okay. So there's a paper by um, Thibault Manville and Vincent Pilot in 2015 about diameter of graph associahedra. And they show that it's at least the number of edges and at most n squared. So for instance, uh, the permutohedra is a special case of uh, graph associahedra for the complete graph. And this has diameter n squared. And there's a question, what is the diameter of tree associahedra? So what is the maximum number of rotations you have to do to transform a search tree on top of a tree into another search tree on top of the same tree for, and you get to choose the, the underlying tree G. And they asked whether it was, uh, there was a, a linear upper bound, right? The best they could do is, is, uh, is uh, an n log n upper bound. And that's quite easy to show that you can transform any search tree into any other uh, in n log n rotations. And uh, they asked, well, can we do better or is there a better lower bound? The best they, lower bound they had was, was linear. So together with Stefan and, and Pablo, we showed that the diameter was actually theta of n log n. So there exist pairs of uh, search trees on top of some um, well-chosen uh, trees G that require n log n rotation to, 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 to transform one into, into the other. So the lower bound was the, the tricky part. The, the upper bound is, is very simple. And uh, here's what we came up with as an example of a, a pair of uh, search trees on top of a tree that require n log n rotation to 
to, to transform one into the other. So the picture on the left is the picture of the tree G on top of which we build the search tree. So it has the shape of a complete binary tree, okay? it, except it's not rooted. Uh, you know, but now if you root it at this node, then you do get a search tree on top of it, right? So the picture on the left is both the tree, the search space, and the search tree on top of it, okay? You start with this node, and then you go, you know, left or right, and then you pick the neighbor, you know, the left or right neighbor as the next root, you know, for uh, the, the, the subtree, and you go on like this. So G has the shape of a complete binary uh, tree, and there's a complete binary search tree on top of it that has this shape. And then the target, the other search tree, which we designed to be you know, far away in terms of rotation distance from the left one, is this one. Instead of starting at the root, well, this is a very inefficient one, right? Whenever you select a degree one vertex as a root, then you only get one child, okay? So it's not true that the number of children is at least two, right? It can be one, so if you start with zero, well, you get one connected component remaining, you just search in this, okay? So you've got this chain of leaves of the tree G, okay? That you get by selecting them as, as root, and then you've got the remaining nodes that are, actually, their order doesn't, doesn't matter, but it, it's the same as on, on, on the top there. And you select them in some, in some order. You order them according to what is known as a bit reversal permutation. So I won't go into too much details, but the idea is that this permutation, you, you, you see you, you alternate between colors. You, you alternate between leaves of the left subtree and leaves of the right subtree, okay? You know, you got, you know, left, right, left, right, left, right. And this is, so this is one level of alternation, but actually this alternation is, is, is it's true recursively. So if you just look at the left, you know, the white leaves there, the indices, in, if you project the permutation on those, then the indices also alternate between the left and the right subtree. Okay, you go zero, and then two, and then one, and then three. So you go left, right, left, right, also recursively. Also in that subtree, you alternate between the two subtrees. And if, if there were, you know, if I had a bigger examples, this would alternate again between the, the sub, sub, subtrees, you know, of this, uh, of this left subtree, and so on, okay? So it's very much alternating. And um, well, we prove, we can prove that this requires, if, if you generalize this example to any uh, number of nodes by increasing the number of levels, you can show that this requires a log n permutation because the number of permutation is a solution of a merge sort like uh, recursion. In order to realize those alternations, you need to do linearly many rotations between a white and a black vertex. So the number of bichromatic rotations, of rotations that involve uh, leaves from both uh, subtrees, this number needs to be linear. And then recursively, the number of monochromatic rotations of, you know, on the left side and on the right side, also by induction, you, you, can, you can perform induction projection, also will require n log n for this new n, which is half, right? So, the number of rotation, if you sum the number of bichromatic and monochromatic rotations for this pair of trees, you realize that it satisfies the recursion that it writes like, okay, T of n is two times T of n over two plus big O of n, okay, plus some linear term, right? And this solves to n log n. So this is an example of a asymptotically, okay, we ignore constant factors of a diametral pair of search trees on trees. So the rotation distance between two search trees on trees can be as large as n log n, while if g is a path, right, if you, for binary search trees, then this was only linear, okay? So there's, a, there's this jump in terms of diameter of associahedra if you go from path, from the regular classical associahedron, so search trees on path, to search trees on trees. This is, this, this is one of the first results that uh, we prove for those structures. Any question on that? Nope. Okay, then let's move on. Now, what about the data structure, adaptive data structure point of view? So is it reasonable to think of 
online search trees on trees? Well, we have everything we need, right? We have this um, finite search space, right? Composed of n vertices of a tree and we have the rotations, right? So we can define just as we did for binary search trees, we can define a computation model in which we have unique cost operation consisting of moving your finger along your search tree, maybe going one to, you know, down to one of the children of the tree or going up to the parent. And then you have the rotation. And then, as I showed you, the rotations are well defined. You can always perform a rotation with your parents. And let's say that all those operations have unique cost. And now let's suppose that we have an access sequence, which is just a sequence, an arbitrary long sequence of nodes, vertices of the underlying tree G. What is the minimum sequence of unique cost operation, finger moves and rotations, that such that you're able to touch these nodes in, in the given order, to touch each node of the sequence. If you want to do the minimum number of such operations to realize, to satisfy your access sequence. And you want to do this online without knowing the future queries, okay? So same question as for binary search tree, can we design competitive online search trees on trees? Okay, is the question clear there? It's a computation model in which those are the only operations that have a cost, right? Maybe, you know, you can imagine an online algorithm that has to think, you know, a lot and do a whole lot of operations before doing any finger move or any rotation. And these operations would come for free, okay? Now, if you want to be sort of reasonable, you would expect that this overhead is not too much. But really, our, our, the, the thing we, we, we care about is the number of unique costs finger moves and rotations, right? This is our objective, and this is how we measure uh, competitiveness. Okay, no question? Okay, so we discussed this. This, is, this was a new idea. This, this has never been, this was never been done before when we started this, this project. And then we went through everything we knew, uh, you know, that there are, you know, binary search tree specialists in, in, in our group. and. Uh, uh, that, yeah, you know, we know many things about binary search trees and, and their theoretical performance. And, and okay, one of them is, for instance, uh, splay trees, right? Can we adapt splay trees? We quickly run into difficulties when we try to, you know, naively adapt known things, you know, most of them would fail. There's something known as the greedy algorithm also that is, that's been, you know, is more recent and has been uh, looked at by, by, by many authors, which is also conjectured to be dynamically optimal, okay, to, to, uh, to reach dynamic uh, optimality, big, big of one competitiveness. Uh, there's this notion of, uh, okay, I, I'm not giving any details here, but there's this also so-called geometric view. This is a beautiful paper by, by uh, Eric Domain and, and, and John Iacono and others, and Patrescu also, I think, on uh, a way to cast the, the, uh, the online binary search tree problem as a purely geometric problem on, uh, of putting points on the grid so that you know, rectangles are filled and, and very beautiful thing. But again, not obvious how to generalize this to, to trees on trees. Eventually, we ended up with you know, one idea that we could push through that you know, would be sort of reasonably generalizable to our trees on trees. So, I'm going to explain this and eventually I mean, the final result is that we managed to get competitive online search trees on trees with the same competitive factor as the best known online binary search trees, right? It, namely log log n. So we can do log log n competitive also for online search trees on trees. So let me explain this to you now. So I'm, I'm okay. Maybe you can think for now, think of regular binary search trees, okay? But I mean, this, this part will not be much different, but I, I, will, I will go on with sort of uh, explaining what we base our generalization on. Think of a uh, balanced search tree, a fixed static uh, balanced search tree on top of your N elements. We'll call it the reference tree, okay? And we'll think of it as a complete binary tree, okay? Log N height, okay? So this is the best worst case static search tree. If you don't do rotations and you optimize for the worst case, this is, this is what you want to have. Uh, this is not the tree that we will use, okay? This is just something that we will keep thinking of 
we keep referencing to, but it's a, it's a fictitious one. This is not the tree that we're going to manipulate, but we'll think of it. And um, think of this tree as uh, for every node, uh, it remembers where in what of the two subtree, in which of the two subtrees, the last access took place. Okay, so we remember we have this access sequence. So we, we're visiting nodes, you know, one after, we want to touch those nodes one after the other. And in the reference tree, we just keep track of where was the last node that was accessed? Was it in the left subtree or in the right subtree? This is indicated by the yellow edges. Every node points with its yellow edge to the uh, subtree where the last access was made. Okay? Now you can see from the picture that this splits our reference balance search tree into uh, paths. Okay? Sometimes those paths only have one node, but sometimes, you know, they're very long. In particular, there is one path that corresponds to the last access that was made. Right? Okay, maybe we access this node and, okay, this path, well, this is the, the last one that was made because this is the one that you obtain starting from the root and following the pointer where the last access was made at every step. Okay? So this, these preferred children pointers, they decompose our reference tree into preferred paths. And now look at all the access that, that you, you, you're making and keep track of the total number of changes in those preferred children. Okay? So you look at the whole access sequence and you look at the total number of times that some node in the reference tree change its preferred children. Okay? How many times those things were, were flipped, you know, along the, 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 the access sequence, right? This is called the interleave bound. This is a quantity that you compute given a reference tree and an access sequence, you can compute this quantity. And it's been proven in, 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 the, in the Tango Tree paper by, by the main et al. Uh, that this quantity is a lower bound on the cost of this access sequence on any dynamic binary search tree. Okay, so any no dynamic binary search, online binary search tree can beat this bound, right? Can do better than this total number of changes of preferred child in, 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 in a reference tree. So you can pick your favorite reference tree, compute this quantity, this will be a lower bound on the best, you know, on the best you can expect from any adaptive search tree, okay? And the, uh, so what happened is that this, there was this structure, the tango tree, that was designed to exactly match this lower bound within a log log n factor, okay? So he, here is how, how, how it goes. So this is now, now I'm describing tango trees, which are online binary search trees, which are log log n competitive big O of log log n competitive. So they, they try to explicitly maintain those preferred paths, okay? And what happens when a new search is carried out, right? When, when you search for a node, well, those preferred paths, are, uh, preferred children are updated, right? And this path decomposition is changing, right? The preferred path is not the same. So, and some, you know, paths are cut and merged with others. So suppose that we had the previous picture, remember we have this picture and we, then we do this search. We go left here and then right here, okay? Then we have to change our preferred path. Now, you know, the preferred children now was on the right, now it's to the left and then it was to the left, now it's to the right. So now we're cutting those paths and we're merging this one with this one, okay? So we are splitting and merging preferred path, okay? This is the effect of one search in this path decomposition is that it performs some, a number of splits and merge. And the number of splits and merge is exactly the number of pointers, you know, of preferred children pointers that are changed, right? So if we can do those splits and merge quickly, we can match the lower bound, okay? And what is done in tango trees is that it's shown that those splits and merges can be done in log log n time. And if you can do this in log log n time, then that means you do log log n time, the lower bound, so you log log n competitive. Okay, and how do you do that? Is you represent actually every path in the decomposition by a small binary search tree. In their implementation, in the original implementation of tango trees, those are red-black trees. 
And whenever you split or merge a preferred path in the path decomposition, you're actually splitting and merging red-black trees. And maybe you've used you know, CLRS uh, as a textbook for your algorithms course. And uh, this is a standard CLRS thing, splitting and merging red-black trees, meaning you, you separate, like you, you split you know, uh, the set of elements with a pivot and you, you, you separate the red-black tree into those that are smaller and those that are larger than the pivot. And, uh, or you can attach also to red-black trees with, with disjoint um, uh, when, where all the elements of one are larger than the elements of the other. And actually you can implement splits and merges of paths by those elementary operations on red-black trees, which take, which run in logarithmic time in the size of the tree. And I'm saying the size of the tree here because it's the size of the tree is not n anymore because remember the reference tree has a height log n. So the size of a path cannot be larger than log n. So if you look at making this, that means you can perform those splits and mergings in log log n time, log of log. Okay. And you do one, a constant number of splits and merge every time there's a preferred children that is updated, right? So you do at most log log n time, the lower bound. So that means you're log log n competitive. Any question on this? One, one thing to realize is that now when I said there's one red black tree for each path in the path decomposition here. And actually if you glue those together, you do have a, search, a, a binary search tree on top of your elements. It's not the reference tree, it's something else. It's the search tree that is obtained by gluing together the little red black trees corresponding to each of the paths in your path decomposition. And you update this path decomposition by doing splits and mergers of those red black trees in log log n time. And your log log n competitive. Is that, is that clear enough? So it's a very beautiful structure, simple enough. I mean, it's completely implementable and, uh, and it's the best known competitive factor for, um, for online binary search trees. So what we try to do is do the same for search trees on trees. So what we could do is prove that the same lower bound holds, right? We can delete, we can define the interleave bound, and we can also prove that this is also a lower bound on the cost of the access sequence for any online uh, search tree on tree, right? Whatever you do, you cannot do better than this interleaf bound. This carries through um, almost verbatim from the original proof. So this, this is one of the things that, that, that works essentially out of the box. So we have the lower bound, now we want to match it in the same way as was done in tango trees. So we want to do tango trees on trees. Okay, so we have balanced search trees. If you think, if you want to do a, a a search tree on top of a tree that has height log n, you can always do this by picking, iteratively picking a centroid vertex in your tree G. It, 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 it always exists, this, this node, this vertex always exists that splits, you know, the tree such that the connected components have on at most n over two uh, uh, vertices in each, right? So you can do logarithmic height just by picking recursively those centroid nodes. This is called the centroid decomposition. It's a very standard thing. So there is a balanced reference tree. And now we want to do also this preferred path decomposition and we want to do those splits and mergers of uh, preferred paths, except that now, well, we're on top of that tree, right? So we cannot, we're not able to represent the, the preferred path with binary search trees anymore. We have to resort to another data structure that's called linker trees. Okay, so there's many different kinds of trees. So, so I, but I'll try to give you a flavor of how this works. In order for this to work, we need the search tree to be so-called Steiner clause. And I think, okay, I think this is, this is an important point because I think those Steiner clause search trees, they, they are important in making things work. And they actually are able to solve quite a few problems, obstacles in, in this generalization. So Steiner clause trees on trees, they okay, have the following definition. So suppose you have a path in your search tree. Suppose you go from, okay, you have a node A and then you follow, you go in the subtree and the next route is B and then you go in the subtree, say, containing this, this portion, these vertices, and then the next route that you have is C. So suppose those dotted lines here indicate a search path going down 
you know, in a search tree on top of the tree G that is pictured there. Um, the convex hull of this set ABC of nodes is just the closure with respect to the path on the tree. Okay, so we pick those nodes together with the union of all the nodes that are on the path between every pair of, of, of them. Okay, so we pick those nodes, those two nodes that are on the path between AC, those three nodes that are on the path between BC, and those two nodes that are on the path between AB. Okay, so we pick all three, all those three guys there. And this together with the original set, we call it the convex hull, right? Just pick the shortest path in, you know, the closure with respect to the shortest path in the tree. And we say that the search tree, uh, the path, sorry, is standard closed if the additional vertices have degree two in the convex hull, okay? So if you look at this guy there that you added, it doesn't have degree two in the convex hull, right? It has degree three. It's connected to three other guys in the convex hull. Well, if you add in your set this, okay, Steiner node, this is, this is why we call them Steiner close, right? We add nodes to connect. Remember Steiner trees, you add those Steiner nodes to connect terminals. Then if you pick the convex hull of this, you realize that the vertices you add in the convex hull, they all have degree two. These are those two vertices. So this set ABCS is Steiner closed, okay? Somehow the intuition is that before going down, you have to go through a node that is on the path between the, the two guys you are currently between, right? And you make those search trees behave a little bit more like intervals. Okay, this is sort of a technical definition, but the intuition is this, that if you do this, then there are many properties of binary search trees that you manage to, to, to generalize there, because somehow those search trees, they behave a little bit more like paths and not, you know, arbitrary trees. And if you, if you do this, uh, then you realize that every path in the reference tree can be associated with a, okay, a tree that we call G of S, okay, we call S the, the, the nodes in the path, the set of nodes in the path, and we call G of S the uh, tree that is obtained by contracting those paths consisting of degree two nodes in the convex hull, okay? So for instance, if we look at this tiny closed path, A, B, S, C, we look at the convex hull, so we have A, B, S, C together with those two intermediate nodes, and we contract them into edges. And this builds a tree on top of S. And what we realize, this is a lemma, it, it's actually simple enough to prove, it's not, it's not very complicated, but I guess at this stage you have to admit it, that if, if you split and merge a path in the reference tree, just as you would do for tango trees, this corresponds to linking and cutting those three G of S, okay? Where a link is pick two disjoint trees and add an edge between them, and a cut is remove one edge of the tree. So by performing links and cuts on those trees G of S, you actually implement the splits and mergers of the preferred path decomposition in your underlying balance reference tree, okay? So you are able to generalize uh, the tango trees Except that instead of using red black trees for storing those preferred paths, you, you would use link cut trees. Okay. This is this is that was, was defined by this is referred to by by, by John as the, the Swiss Army knife of data structures. It's uh, a data structure for maintaining collection of trees, and you can do links and cuts between them. So linking two trees by adding an edge between two of the no of, of their nodes and uh, cutting, removing an edge of the tree. And you can do all these operations in log n time, where n is the total number of nodes, okay? And if you do this, then you end up with a, uh, a structure that actually follows the GST model and is an online log log n, big of log log n competitive uh, search tree on tree. So as a summary, you go, so you construct the balanced Steiner closed reference tree, you decompose this into paths, into preferred paths, and each of the paths induces each tree that is obtained as a contr by contracting edges in a, in a subtree of G. And our preferred paths are updated. Whenever you do search, you update those preferred children, right? As, in, as, as, as I explained on, on, on BST. And these updates, they correspond to linking and cutting trees, G of S. And then you use link cut trees. And the magic then, the very beautiful thing, and we, it took us a while to, to end up with, you know, everything in place. If, is that if you look at how uh, linker trees work, they actually decompose those trees again into paths 
and use play trees to represent each of the paths. So what we end up with is a two-level decomposition in, of trees into paths. First, from preferred, the, the, the reference tree into preferred paths, and then those preferred paths induce trees that are in turn decomposed into paths by linker trees. And you end up with a collection of splay trees that control the paths on the trees GS. And if you glue them together, you, only, you actually get a search tree on tree. And you update this dynamically using the link and cut algorithm and the preferred path decomposition. And you have an online search tree on tree that is log log n competitive. So I understand it may look a bit cumbersome and hairy at this stage. But really, those are well understood tools. In particular, linker trees are very standard data structure that you can, I mean, you can implement them. It's, it's, a, it's a realistic algorithm. And the putting things together is not, is not that crazy. It's, uh, OK, it's a bit involved. But this is, we believe, the right thing to do to generalize those tango trees. Um, so we managed to, to do this, to achieve the same um, competitive competitivity factor as for regular binary search trees. That's it. So we proved that the diameter of tree associahedra is theta of n log n in the worst case, and we design log log n competitive online search trees on trees. Um, this is far from being the end of the story. There's a lot of uh, good questions to ask about those, especially, I believe, from the data structures point of view. Um, there's a preprint. I just heard of it this morning. Um, go through um, by Laszlo Kosma uh, on uh, splay trees on trees. So they seem to have managed to define some kind of uh, a splay tree data structure on top of on top of trees, like 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 we do for tango trees. But they they, they seem to have some partial results at least uh, and, and proposal for uh, generalization of of splay trees. And um, they actually do formulate the dynamic optimality conjecture for this sort of wide reaching generalization of, of binary search trees that there would exist uh, a dynamically optimal online uh, search trees on trees and maybe those play trees uh, could be a candidate. So lots of, yeah, good question. I mean, anything you know about binary search tree, does it hold, can it be generalized to search trees on trees and, and how far can we go? Thanks for listening, that's it. Yeah, I'm okay. I was a bit maybe longer than expected. Hope it's okay. Any question? Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Thank you very much, okay. first of all, awesome. for the talk. Thanks. Um, so these these diameters, uh, I mean, we've seen this uh, like specifically constructed pair where you get the diameter n log n, and then um, we know uh, for the associahedron it's just n. So what do you think is the typical case? Like for most underlying trees, g you would be on the upper end or on the lower end? Uh, can you say something like this? Um. No, I mean, uh, well, we're interested in the worst case, right? So we know there are such pairs. Um, maybe if, if, if you want a data structure, maybe you want to restrict to families of trees between which you know the diameter is smaller that you can do. And I think this is, I, we, we can show, for instance, that if you have Steiner closed search trees then the diameter is actually linear. Mm -hmm. And then you, you can keep them, like you can maintain the invariant that they're Steiner closed uh, uh, and, and, and the, the rotations, and then uh, there you can show that the diameter is, is linear. So that's, but you force this, the structure so that it has, the rotation graph has linear diameter. Um, well, in general, I mean, yeah, maybe if you pick random ones, chances are that they're close together, but otherwise, you know, well, there are, you know, distant pairs. And uh, what, what we're, I'm also looking at with, with other people in, in Paris is uh, what's the diameter of graph associahedra for the families of graphs. And it's sometimes kind of counterintuitive. You mean not trees? Not trees. Like, but if, for instance, uh, um, I think we can show that the diameter for um, trees, uh, for the associahedra defined on top of uh, graphs that have path width two, mm -hmm. 
mm. so that are, you know, in terms of this parameter close to pass, already have uh, n log n, like the diameter is already n log n and not linear anymore. So, so it's an interesting topic and I'm, I'm pursuing some yeah, collaboration with, with other people on, on diameter of associate heat graph for different families of graphs, but I don't have much intuition. So um, how do you define the, the, the tree on top of the graph? Like oh, it's the same thing. You pick, a, you pick, a, you pick a, a node, you remove it, and then see the connected components. Ah, but in this case, it could happen that it stays connected. I see. It, it, could ha it can happen for trees if you select a leaf. Right, but right. It can also for graphs, yes. Yeah, so yeah. another way of seeing this is that every node is, is uh, you, you sort of contract the path, and you turn every node into a separator. Mm-hmm. So you can see those as a, a separator trees. Every node is a separator, and then you, 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 they, you know that you have more than one children. But it's essentially the same thing. So what's known for search trees on graphs? Well, there's a, a lot of combinatorics, right, for search trees on graphs, uh, graph associahedra and things. Uh, there are, from algorithms people, there are different models of um, for searching in a graph. There's this recent model, for instance, that uh, related to this Stock 16 paper, I think, where uh, the Oracle gives you a, so you, you, you check one, uh, you ask a question of where to look for it uh, at the vertex, and then it gives you an edge on uh, the, the Oracle answers with an edge on a shorter path from that node to your target, right? And there you can do your thoughts like search trees and, uh, and, and define search strategies that, that have the shape of trees with respect to this oracle. Uh, in terms of um, uh, search trees on graphs, like we define them and, and adaptivity, uh, essentially nothing is known, but there's a lot of, uh, maybe it's not as nice as, as on top of trees and, and maybe you end up with, you know, not so interesting search algorithms. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but there's this combinational point of view, and then people looking at real, like actual useful models of searching in graphs. But with this definition and the, the um, and online search trees on graphs, uh, I, I know of, I don't know of anything. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure many things remain to be done. Any other question? Thank you. Yeah, are there any other questions? Ramanujan asked me to to wrap up the session because somehow his audio failed. Oh. Okay. So maybe maybe one last question. Are there any any um, other cases where there's any hope for for um, getting exact values for this diameter? Um, because I mean, for this associahedron, this is like a long-term research project, right? To figure out the exact uh, value somehow. Yes, yes, it's a, uh, um, I would say it's tough to get exact values uh, is, is, yeah, I mean, diameters of polytopes is, of, of, of combinatorial polytopes is, uh, it's hard because it's, um, you know, one, one motivation, I mean, for some people, one of the motivation is the Hirsch conjecture, right? Like, like the performance of, uh, of linear programming involved mm. uh, involving pivoting on, on edges of, uh, of polytopes. So, you can ask this diameter question for, for many kinds of polytopes and it, it's uh, and for some of them if, if, if it's you know if it's general if it's if it's a, a large family then it, it can it can get really difficult um, yeah diameter and Hamiltonicity you, you you know you know about this too uh, those are the standard question you want to ask about the, the skeleton of these polytopes and I think they're they're hard questions mm -hmm. uh, are Hamiltonian I think that's proven. Right, uh, but um, yeah, I'm. No, we should we should dig more. I think there are probably are things to say. Yeah, we only have this asymptotic bound, ignoring constant factors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, are there other questions from the audience or in the chat? If not, then thank you very much, Sean, for this very nice talk. And thank you for the invitation. Thanks. Thank you all for for listening.